Welcome to the Tropical American region of Gladys Porter Zoo. This part of the zoo showcases wildlife that is found in both North and South America. Most of the species on display here are birds. Gladys Porter Zoo is uniquely suited to keeping tropical animals from all over the world due to the pleasant weather that is experienced throughout the year. The first bird you are likely to see in this section of Gladys Porter Zoo are our flamingos. Two different species of flamingos are kept at our zoo, the Caribbean and the Chilean. These elegant and brilliantly colored birds are always a hit among zoo guests. They sift through the water using their comb-like filter within their bills to feed on tiny shrimp-like crustaceans. During their summer breeding season, zookeepers will loosen up and water the soil to allow our flamingos to construct their nest mounds. A flamingo will lay one single egg at the top of its mound. The added height of the mound is meant to keep the egg from getting submerged in the water. Here we have our national mascot, the bald eagle. This large and magnificent bird of prey is found throughout most of North America. They mainly keep to forested habitats with access to nearby bodies of water because their primary food source is fish. They will also prey upon birds, reptiles, amphibians, and invertebrates such as crabs. The bald eagle is also known to feed on carrion, and even on occasion will steal food from other predators. Bald eagles are incredible nest builders. They will continuously add to their nest year after year. The largest bald eagle nest ever measured was 10 feet in diameter and 20 feet tall. Bald eagle populations were in dramatic decline in the mid to late 1900s due to hunting and secondary poisoning with pesticides. In 1978, the U.S. government classified the bald eagle as an endangered species, and this allowed their numbers to recover. This rowdy bunch here are known as macaws. A group of macaws is called a pandemonium. Macaws are the largest parrots on our planet and come in a variety of colorations and sizes. Here at Gladys Porter Zoo, we keep our resident macaws in a specialized aviary that offers them roosting cavities on the walls of their habitat, which is very similar to what they would use in the wild. They will eat a variety of plant matter such as fruit, nuts, seeds, flowers, and leaves. Some wild macaws also consume a specific type of clay that is found along the Amazonian riverbanks. Some experts believe that this clay may neutralize the toxins naturally found in some types of unripe fruits that they eat. Macaws have always been highly sought after pets by people all over the world and because of this desirability, their wild population has diminished considerably. This is the Great Curacao. This large bird is found in tropical forests along the eastern coastline of Mexico, throughout Central America, and down along the coastlines of Colombia and Ecuador. The Great Curacao is a social bird that will often be found in groups of 10 or more. They are also monogamous birds, meaning that they will stay faithful to their chosen mate for life. These birds do exhibit sexual dimorphism. That is a difference in size and color between males and females. They feed mostly on fruit and will scratch at the forest floor with their talons to unearth fallen berries and seeds. On occasion, they will feed on insects and other smaller animals. Curacaos are prized by indigenous peoples for their meat and this has caused their population to diminish. This odd looking bird here is the king vulture. Their natural range extends as far north as southern Mexico and reaches down into Argentina. The king vulture receives its name because according to Mayan legend, it is a messenger between humans and the gods. As is common with most other vultures, the king vulture will feed almost exclusively on carrion. Because of their diet, vultures are among the only birds that have a keen sense of smell. Also common with other vultures is the featherless head and neck. This is for hygienic purposes. It prevents bacteria from accumulating on its plumage 
and exposes its skin to the sterilizing effects of the sun. Welcome to our free flight aviary. This large building is designed to safely house several species of birds all while offering the best living conditions that they require. Inside the free flight aviary is a two-story waterfall and a small stream that wanders throughout the building. The semi-enclosed design of this building allows in plenty of sunlight and blocks out fast-moving winds. The continuous flow of water, along with plenty of sunshine, creates the perfect tropical climate to keep our birds happy. This curious looking bird is a rosate spoonbill, known in Spanish as the espatula rosada. Spoonbills are often found wading in shallow water, usually with other spoonbills or wading birds. They are usually mistaken for flamingos because they share the same coloration. They too turn their brilliant color of pink because of their crustacean heavy diets. They use their specialized bills to sweep through the shallow water for small crustaceans and fish. Interestingly, the rosate spoonbill does not have a spoon-shaped bill when hatched. At 9 days old, the bill begins to flatten. At 16 days, it will appear more spoon-like. And at 39 days, the bill is fully grown. This brilliantly colored bird is called the Scarlet Ibis. Scarlet Ibises are found along the coastlines of South America's northern countries and are also found on several Caribbean islands. They inhabit mud flats, estuaries, shorelines, and shallow bays. Ibises have long downward curved bills that allow them to forage in shallow waters and probe the mud for crustaceans and mollusks. They also eat fish, insects, frogs, and even snakes. Much like the flamingo, the scarlet ibis turns its brilliant shade of pink due to its crustacean-heavy diet. Their overall population is currently in decline due to habitat destruction and poaching. This is a plain chachalaca. As its name may suggest, this plain-looking and unassuming bird's look belies the loud and boisterous calls that it can produce. The name Chachalaca is an onomatopoeia for its trademark call. When flocked together, their chorus will drown out any other sounds in the woods. It is a native species of bird that commonly inhabits the dense thorn scrub thickets that are so common in the Rio Grande Valley and all along Mexico's Gulf coastline. The chachalaca is a galliform, which puts it in the same taxonomic group as chickens, turkeys, and even peacocks. The chachalaca is an omnivorous bird that will eat leaves, berries, seeds, insects, and even small invertebrates. Here we have a small family unit of trumpeter hornbills. Although these birds are not found in tropical America, geographically speaking, they are kept here in the tropical America section of the zoo because the accommodations within the free flight aviary are just right for these birds. Found in the areas of central and southeastern Africa, they keep to humid forests and savannas. Hornbills are considered omnivorous animals, mostly feeding on fruits and large insects. Their most iconic characteristic is their large and bulky bill. The large protuberance on top of their bill is called a cask and believed to amplify their calls. When a hornbill female is ready to lay her eggs, she will find a hollowed out tree trunk or rocky crevice, get nice and comfortable inside, and then her mate will seal her within using mud and leaf matter. There, she will remain for approximately 75 days while her mate will feed her and the hatchlings through a pecked hole in the wall. Once the young are ready to fly, the wall is then broken down and the female and her brood will emerge. Also within the free flight aviary, we have a small band of band-tailed pigeons. These pigeons are found along the west coast of North America from Alaska down into Central America. They are also found in South America along the Andes mountain range. 
The band-tailed pigeon is visually very similar to the rock pigeon that is normally found in urban city centers and is as adept at surviving within these urban zones as they are in remote forests. Band-tailed pigeons are very social and normally congregate in bands as large as 50 individuals. These pigeons eat mostly seeds, buds, flowers, and wild and domestic fruit. Band-tailed pigeons are the closest living relatives to the passenger pigeon, which went extinct just over 100 years ago due to overhunting. The band-tailed pigeon's global population is currently in decline due to overhunting and habitat loss. Here we have one of the world's smallest species of ducks, the ringed teal. Ringed teals are found in the South American countries of Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, Bolivia, and Brazil. They frequent densely wooded swamps and marshes. They are classified as wood ducks, meaning that their webbed feet are smaller than other ducks. So they have an awkward gait on land, but they do have small claws at the ends of their toes that allow them to roost in trees. These omnivorous ducks will eat a variety of aquatic vegetation and small invertebrates. These are our Chiloe widgeons. They are small and very social ducks that are found in a large range within the continent of South America. They are found in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Uruguay, as well as the Chiloe Archipelago and the Falkland Islands. They commonly inhabit freshwater lakes, marshes, and rivers. This omnivorous duck will feed on aquatic plants, grasses, algae, small aquatic invertebrates, and even small fish. Their species name, Sibilatrix, means whistler, which is a direct reference to this bird's vocalizations, which sound much like a child's whistle. This is a very widespread duck, and thankfully, human activity has not had very much of a negative effect on their global population. The Fulvus whistling duck is quite the cosmopolitan bird species. Being found on four separate continents, North and South America, Africa, and Asia, it is amongst the most widespread ducks in the world. Its generic name, Dendrocygnus, quite literally means tree swan. Unlike many other ducks, whistling ducks can roost in trees. Also, like swans, both female and male whistling ducks will incubate their eggs and then, together, care for their young long after they've hatched. The Fulvus whistling duck is not currently threatened with extinction due to its extremely large global range. A close cousin to the Fulvus whistling duck is the white-faced whistling duck. This duck can be found throughout the continent of South America except for the western coastlines and throughout most of Africa. Like most other whistling ducks, the white-faced whistling ducks will feed on aquatic vegetation, seeds, and, on occasion, invertebrates. Unlike most other ducks, whistling ducks are monogamous since they do not have the bright colors to attract new mates every breeding season. Instead, they invest more time and energy into maintaining their relationship with their mate. The white-faced whistling duck is not currently threatened with extinction. Here we have a pair of blue-bellied rollers. These birds are native to countries found in Western and Central Africa. Their preferred habitats include wooded savannas, agricultural developments, and forest edges. Blue-bellied rollers are classified as Coratiaforms. Coratiaforms are an order of birds that are known for their loud and acrobatic courtship displays. Rollers will fly back and forth in the sky and teeter to the ground all while vocalizing loudly. They are primarily insectivorous but will also prey upon lizards and small snakes. The blue-bellied roller is not currently endangered. This large bird is called the Crested Screamer. Crested Screamers, also known as Southern Screamers, are found near bodies of fresh water in the countries of Brazil, Bolivia, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Argentina. They are omnivorous birds that mostly feed on vegetation but will prey upon insects and other small prey. The crested screamer may not look it, 
but despite its lack of webbed feet, it is a great swimmer. They spend much of their time wading and swimming within their preferred habitats of swamps and marshes. As their name suggests, screamers are loud birds that emit an ear-piercing call when threatened. Some indigenous people have even begun to take young screamer chicks to raise alongside their own domestic fowl to serve as watchbirds in order to protect them from predators. Here we have the Sandhill Crane. This large and visually striking bird is found throughout much of North America, Mexico, Cuba, and even across the Bering Strait into Siberia. Cranes situated at more northern latitudes will make the nearly 6,000 mile journey into the American Southwest or northern Mexico to spend the winter. Sandhill cranes will eat plants, grains, and various small animals such as mice, snakes, and insects. They will even use their bills to dig into the mud to root out tubers in agricultural fields, which puts them at odds with farmers. They are not currently endangered and their overall population is holding steady for now. There is also no shortage of freeloading birds at Gladys Porter Zoo. Many birds come in to do a bit of fishing, swimming, nesting, or perhaps even stealing that quick bite of food. Also because the grounds here are so inviting, many migratory birds will use the zoo as a quick resting and refueling station before continuing to their final destination. Now that you've taken a comprehensive tour through our tropical American aviaries, we would like to introduce you to a reptile whose protection is part of the very core of our conservation initiative. In 1835, an English naturalist named Charles Darwin sailed around the world aboard the HMS Beagle. The ship docked at Santo Cristobal Island, where Darwin began a thorough survey of several of the islands where he collected geological and biological samples. It wasn't until after his return to England that he fully realized the significance of his data collection, which then birthed the theory of evolution. Many curious animals were cataloged on the islands, animals such as large flightless cormorants and underwater iguanas. Another island resident can be seen here at Gladys Porter Zoo. This is the largest tortoise in the world, the Galapagos tortoise. Most of the tortoises in this habitat are between the ages of 25 to 45 years. However, we do have one female who is over 100 years old. Wild Galapagos tortoises commonly live well over 100 years, many reaching or even exceeding 150 years. Galapagos tortoises are found on a chain of Pacific islands that form the Galapagos Archipelago. The islands are found approximately 550 miles off the coastline of Ecuador. There are several different subtypes of Galapagos tortoises, each unique to their own island within the archipelago. They spend their sleeping hours on the warm, arid lowlands that are made up of volcanic soil that supports little vegetation except for grasses. After they wake, they begin the long and slow trek to the cooler highlands that support more vegetation for feeding and bathing. The word Galapago is an antiquated form of the Spanish word for saddle. This is a direct reference to the upturned edge of some Galapagos tortoise shells located near the base of their necks that bears a resemblance to a saddle horn. 
average sizes for these shell giants has them at around 5 feet from nose to tail and around 550 pounds. The largest of them can reach 6 feet from head to tail and up to 5 feet from the ground to the top of the shell. The largest male ever tipped the scales at 914 pounds. Tortoises are different from aquatic turtles because they are not built for swimming. They lack the sleek shells and the webbed feet of their swimming cousins. Despite this, they do swim, just not very fast. Galapagos tortoises are plant-eating animals which subsist on various grasses, forbs, and leaves. They also have a penchant for prickly pear cactus, which not only nourishes but also hydrates them since the cactus is exceedingly succulent. The Galapagos tortoise is near extinction. Historically, sailors would stop at these islands for supplies and food. It is believed that 99% of their total population was lost in this manner. Current day, the few that remain on the islands are threatened by vermin and cats, which ravage nests and hatchlings. Also, livestock competes with the tortoises for vegetation. Here at Gladys Porter Zoo, the Galapagos tortoise belongs to a national breeding program that strives to increase their population by producing the healthiest possible young. The most important mission at Gladys Porter Zoo is educating the public about the importance of wildlife conservation. One of the most effective methods to achieve our mission of public education is through our Animal Ambassador Program. Just as their name implies, a zoo's Animal Ambassador serves as a representative to their more wild counterparts. Animal Ambassadors allow the public to create an emotional tie to wildlife and can ultimately foster an appreciation for the natural world. This is a long-tailed chinchilla and his name is Jax. We don't know exactly how old Jax is, or much of his history for that matter, because he was a donation. But what we do know is that he's a healthy, full-grown male chinchilla. Chinchillas belong to the taxonomic order called Rodentia, which is a group of animals that includes mice, rats, gerbils, and hamsters. Long-tailed chinchillas, as their name suggests, have long tails. Their tails serve as a stabilizing rudder as they're jumping or sailing through the air. They are incredible jumpers. The word chinchilla means little chincha, which is a direct reference to the indigenous chincha people of Peru. Chinchillas <clears throat> are found only in the nation of Peru. They're mountain dwelling animals that are typically found at elevations between 10,000 to 16,000 feet. Because chinchillas live at such high altitudes, they are adapted to cold weather. Chinchillas have an extremely thick coat of fur that almost completely covers their entire body, except for their ear flaps. Uh, during especially cold weather, the chinchilla will curl up its ears and fluff up its fur in order to retain that body heat. Conversely, if when the temperatures manage to warm up, the chinchilla's body will regulate by dilating the blood vessels within its own ears. This allows more blood to flow through the ear flaps, thus allowing more body heat to escape through the thin skin there. The coat of the chinchilla is exceedingly dense with fur because for every hair follicle in the animal's skin, between 60 to 75 strands of hair will grow. That's how their coat does such a wonderful job at keeping its skin thoroughly insulated from the cold. Chinchillas are primarily foliverous rodents. That means they eat mostly leaves, but they will on rare occasions eat insects and even bird eggs. Female chinchillas are larger than the males and they're also the dominant sex. They are aggressive towards other chinchillas, especially males during breeding time. They are social creatures that normally live in colonies of up to 100 individuals. Uh, female chinchillas usually give birth to two to three young, but they can have up to six babies. Interestingly, chinchillas, unlike most other rodents, give birth to young that are considered precocial. That means that they're not completely helpless as newborns. Shortly after birth, baby chinchillas are able to open up their eyes and walk or even run in order to follow their mother around. These furry little rodents normally live about 10 years, but they can live, uh, in some cases, up to 20 years. Chinchillas are widely considered to have the softest fur in the world. 
Because of this, their pelts have been harvested by indigenous peoples as far back as 1500 AD. However, it wasn't until the 1970s within the US fashion industry where demand really kicked into high gear. Fur coats, mittens, gloves, hats, etc. In order to make a coat of chinchilla fur, about 150 chinchillas would have to be harvested. This is believed, there is believed to be fewer than 10,000 chinchillas left in the wild. Another major factor leading to their population decline is habitat loss due to the harvesting and burning of the algarrobia shrub, whose fruit extract is sought after for tanning leather. The pet trade has also had a slightly less effect on their global population. There's believed to be more chinchillas living in the U U.S. under private ownership than in the wild. The chinchilla does benefit from local and even international protections. However, because their native territories are in such remote and inhospitable areas, those laws are very, very difficult to enforce. Here we have a ball python. This handsome fella here is named Samson, and Samson's about 23 years old. There are a little over 40 different species of python distributed throughout the continents of Africa, Asia, and Australia. Now, this python comes from the grasslands and open woodlands of sub-Saharan Africa. The ball python receives its namesake due to their propensity to ball up when either scared or nervous, much like an armadillo. Another common name they have is the royal python, and that's because many African rulers, including the infamous Queen Cleopatra, were fans of this particular species of snake. The royal python quickly became a snake that was typically associated with African royalty. Yet another common name for this type of python is the alien head snake. This pattern that you see here is typical and tends to be found throughout the body of the snake. Ball pythons typically grow to around 3.5 feet long, um, but they have been known to reach lengths of up to six feet. Snakes and reptiles have a very interesting method of olfaction, smelling. They use their tongue to pick up scent particles in the air. The scent-covered tongue is then pressed against their Jacobson's organ located on the roof of their mouth. The Jacobson's organ is essentially a bundle of sensory nerves that have a direct line of communication with the brain. So pythons also have an array of heat-sensing pits located right above their upper lip. Located inside these pits are extremely sensitive temperature-sensing nerves. Uh, they allow the snake to detect warm-blooded prey up to six feet away. Their most common prey items are rodents, and here at Gladys Porter Zoo, that's exactly what we feed Samson. Ball pythons are carnivorous animals, and they have very flexible upper and lower jaws. Their teeth are needle sharp. They are recurved in order to seize prey more efficiently. Their upper jaw is lined with four separate rows of teeth, and the lower jaw has two separate rows. Once their intended prey has been captured within their jaws, the python then begins to constrict. Once their prey has been subdued, the snake will then swallow it whole. Now obviously snakes don't have hands, so getting a large rodent to fit down its gullet may sound like a daunting task, but the snake's flexible mandible, or its lower jaw, can be extended downwards. Additionally, the side, the side, each side of the mandible can be extended laterally, so there's no connecting bone at the front of the mandible. Each row of teeth on the mandible will then alternate flexing forward to pull the prey inside its throat, where muscular wave-like contractions will then proceed to push the prey down the rest of the way. Python females are one of the few species of snakes that will take care or even crudely incubate their eggs after laying them. The mother will gently coil around her clutch of eggs and then shiver. These fast and repeated muscular contractions will generate heat, which will in turn incubate her eggs. The clutch size can be anywhere between one to 11 eggs. This is Fluffy. He's a seven-year-old male American alligator. There are only two living species of alligators on our planet, the Chinese and the American alligator. Alligators belong to a group of reptiles that are called crocodilia. This group, this group includes crocodiles, alligators, caiman, and gharials. Alligators are different from other crocodilians due to the shape of that broad U-shaped snout and the large sizes that they reach as adults. The American alligator is mostly limited to the United States and they're found along the eastern coast as far north as North Carolina, down south to Florida, and all along the Gulf Coast stopping at the Rio Grande Valley. 
There are also small populations of them that range into northeastern Mexico, along the Texas-Mexico border. The word alligator is a corruption of the Spanish word el lagarto, meaning the lizard. Adult alligators reach lengths of around eight and a half all the way up to 14 feet long, with males being at the higher end of that range. They commonly weigh anywhere between 200 to 800 pounds, dependent on their length and girth. The world record for the largest gator was discovered in Alabama in 2014. When it was measured, it was 15 feet and 9 inches long and weighed a whopping 1,012 pounds. Alligators, along with all other species of crocodilians, are prehistoric animals. They've existed on our planet for 300 million years and haven't had much of a need to evolve since then. They're extremely capable predators, which use concealment and surprise to capture their prey. Common alligator prey includes turtles, wading birds and ducks, small terrestrial mammals, frogs, snakes, fish, uh, and even other smaller alligators. On occasion, they even eat carrion. Alligators have been known to swallow stones uh, and even small metal objects like bottle caps. These hard objects in their bellies allow the gator's digestion to break down meat and bone more efficiently. Alligators communicate with each other using a range of low-frequency sounds emitted from their throats. Also, during mating season, males will bellow loudly to drive off any rival males from their territory. Additionally, juvenile gators will chirp loudly when there's danger in the area to let any other gators in the area know. Overall, they have poor vision, uh, but they do have the ability to see in low light condition. Their ears are located right behind their eyes and their ears are hypersensitive to underwater vibrations. Also, protruding through the scales along the jaw area are integumentary sense organs, or ISOs. What those are are nerve endings that are sticking out through each scale. This is useful because reptile scales are basically thickened plates of keratin, which is what our fingernails and hair are made out of. Thick scales prevent reptiles from having a sensitive sense of touch. This is why ISOs are important to crocodilians. It boosts their sense of touch, allowing them to feel any movement in the water uh, that's near them and will even give them a better sense of what prey they have within their jaws. Alligators are masters at ambushing their prey. Um, when they float at the surface of the water, their eyes, their ears, and even their nostrils will be exposed to open air, while the rest of the body remains submerged. This essentially renders them invisible in the murky waters that they're found in. Wild alligators commonly live between 20 to 30 years, while alligators within zoos can live up to 46, all the way up to 56 years. Right up until 100 years ago, the American alligator was nearly hunted to extinction.